Okay, so it's a couple of minutes past three, so we shall get started. Um, I'm Emma Filtness, lecturer in creative writing at Brunel, um, and I will be your host for this session. So welcome, thank you for joining us. Um, so we're here today to celebrate the launch of Fraser Lee's latest spooky novel, which made its way out into the world last week um, from Flame Tree Press. Um, so Fraser's a novelist, a screenwriter, a filmmaker. Um, his novel, The Lamplighters, was a Bram Stoker Award finalist. Uh, Fraser's a member of the Horror Writers Association. Um, and today he's going to read from his novel. We're going to ask him a few questions. Hopefully all of you are also going to ask some questions. But to start us off and get us in the mood, we have some of our Brunel creative writing students who are going to share their genre masterpieces with us today. So pieces of flash fiction that they've written during their time with us. Um, please feel free to use the chat to share your thoughts and feelings, your responses, um, share some love regarding the stories, um, your love of horror, etc. So we're going to start with a student reader. Um, so Chloe, if you would like to take to the screen and regale us with your tale. Hey, hello. Um, okay, so my story is called Endangered Species. I'm sorry about the sudden shadow being sucked into the shadow realm. Emily bit into a triangle of toast and chewed for five straight minutes. Anna continued to wash the dishes. The dish in Anna's hand was clean, as was everything in the house, scrubbed to a point of painful spotlessness. Like anyone who desperately does not want to talk to their wife, Anna cleaned relentlessly. Emily understood. At least her wife's coping mechanism was productive. Meanwhile, all Emily could do was make mulch of toast. Emily swallowed and the oily mush caught in her throat. She coughed and sipped her lukewarm tea to try and loosen it. She took a breath. Anna? Anna didn't turn around. She was still washing the same dish. It had been seven minutes now. Emily took another swig of tea. Anna, you're right. Anna looked over her shoulder and Emily did not miss the sigh. Somehow it was the things like that, the tiny blink and you miss it things that really stung. Why would I not be all right? Anna said casually. Emily fiddled with the butter knife. I was just thinking about what? About, well, something that's been on my mind these past few months. A low hum rumbled in the distance. Both Emily and Anna pretended they couldn't hear it, pretended they couldn't feel the slight accompanying vibration. Yes, said Anna. I was thinking about... The hum grew louder. Emily stopped talking and waited for it to pass. Anna, doing the same, pretended to look for something on the countertop. A few moments later, the humming dissipated. Emily cleared her throat. I was thinking maybe we should... The hum returned and this time stayed, growing gradually louder, the hum became a buzz, a deep nasal drone like a bagpipe. The house began to vibrate again. Emily raised her voice. I was... what? The buzz quickly drowned out Emily's words, as did the rattling clink of the cups and cutlery clattering together as the buzz crescendoed. I wanted to talk about us, but Emily couldn't even hear herself at this point. Anna dropped her plate into the sink. For God's sake, she shouted as the plate clanked against the sides. Every single bloody day. It will be gone in a minute, yelled Emily. Anna rolled her eyes and crossed her arms. Emily, for the need to look anywhere else, turned to the kitchen window and leant an arm over the chair back. It wasn't going to be gone in a minute. She knew this. In fact, the 20 foot bumblebee was ambling closer and closer to the house. Go away, thought Emily miserably. Just bugger off, not today. The buzzing stopped abruptly as the kitchen went dark. The bee landed on the house with a dull thump and settling dust from light fixtures. Dust which settled on every inch of Anna's spotless kitchen. Anna scowled. She then stormed across the kitchen, turned on the lights and joined Emily by the window. They stood in silence, looking at their own reflections. At least it's quiet now, said Emily, as the bee's furry black underside brushed against the glass. She saw a giant shining leg pushing up the grass on their lawn. It's trying to pollinate again. We're not a flower, growled Anna, glaring out the window. The 64 flowers are 10 minutes down the road at the plant. Why can they never tell the bloody difference? 
It must think the roof looks colourful, said Emily. In the window's reflection, Emily saw the glance which was covertly shot her way. We never should have, should have bought a house so close to the nuclear flower plant, grumbled Anna, almost under her breath. It was cheap, said Emily. Anna wheeled on her and frantically gestured to the giant insect outside their window. Yes, for a reason. She threw another disdainful look at the bee's furry belly before striding back to the sink. She picked up a fork and started aggressively scrubbing dust from the grooves of its prongs. It could be worse, Emily ventured carefully. My cousin lives under the petals. Nothing but shade all year round, and you can imagine the amount of bees that... She looked back over her shoulder. Anna was glaring into the sink, still scrubbing. We'd have laughed about that a year ago, said Emily quietly. Anna didn't look up. Emily turned back to the window and watched the bee. In America, they just let the bees die, she thought. Hadn't bothered with genetically mutating giant flowers and all that. They just let them die. She glanced at Anna's reflection, then looked back at the bee. The walls shook with a few preliminary buzzes. Then the bee kicked off from the house, sending dust whirling through the kitchen once more. Emily turned and grabbed the cutlery falling off the table as the kitchen rocked. She could hear nothing under the deafening whir of the bee's wings. She slammed the butter knife down, looked up at Anna and cried, I want a divorce. The bee lifted higher and Emily's ears stopped ringing. In the ensuing quiet, Anna turned around. What did you say? Emily blinked, her hands pressed against the table. I said, could you do me more toast? Anna rolled her eyes and put some bread in the toaster. Emily went back to the window. The bee swayed lazily through the sky in a direction of the flower plant, its buzz hitting the house in waves. Emily didn't notice Anna beside her until she spoke. I wish we'd never managed to save them, she said, her eyes dark as she gazed after the bee. Emily shrugged. I just wish they hadn't grown so big. It's amazing what they're doing with the giant flowers, but it just feels like the problem got bigger to fit the solution. I wish we'd never got married, said Anna. Emily's stomach clenched. Then she sighed. Yeah. Together they watched the bee bob along the sky, floating in the direction of the flowers big enough to hold it. The flowers it fits. Thank you very, very much, Chloe. Um, yeah, all that sort of tension and stagnation Plus GMBs, and I do love a good pun, so thank you very thank much. You. So next up, we have Flint. Hello, um, I, I'm the author of The Cannery, which I will be reading now. Summer was my favourite season. Not for the sweltering heat or the crunch of dying grass under my Birkenstocks. Not even for seeing my childhood home again or quiet evenings reading dusty books in my bedroom. No, summer was my favourite season because I was reunited with my best friends. We'd grown apart, scattered with no common ground. Summer was just when we dropped everything and just got to spend time together like old times. I just hoped they were going to like their surprise. Tabitha was the first to notice me. She waved excitedly, pulling me in for a hug. Sarah! It was good to see her too. I never felt like I'd missed my friends this past year. Was it just time? Or maybe it was because this was going to be the first summer after Jack died. It was an accident. This one, I swear, was a genuine moment of human error. I mean, Jack was always reckless, clumsy too. He didn't know how the machines worked. I tried to catch him, I did, but there was only so far over the railing I could go before he'd be following me. Sarah, hey, Sarah. I blinked, Ben was waving his hand in front of my face. Hmm? Oh, sorry. His face softened. Were you thinking about... Yeah, forget it, okay? Tabitha put an arm around me. It wasn't your fault, Sarah. Did you ever see someone about it? Ben asked. Uh, yeah. I did. She told me, well, she told me it might help if I went back. You know, for closure. I exchanged a look I pretended not to see. Are you sure? Tabitha said. I mean, we don't have to. Not if, no. I want to, I insisted. Anything to help. We were surprised to find that the same entrance me and Jack had snuck in through hadn't been sealed up. 
Guess the stories might have been enough to deter nosy tourists. A hole in the chain link fence led to a yard so drowned under layers of dead leaves that you couldn't feel solid concrete under your feet. Several small bones, maybe squirrel, crunched as we moved. Despite everything, it was a beautiful sight. The sky had just turned purple with a pleasant breeze washing away the suffocating heat of the day. The birds were coming in to roost and the last rays of sun bounced off the trees, casting a cool shadow over our path. There, I pointed to the fire escape. That's how you got in? Ben seemed dubious. Yeah, why? I don't know. Is it safe? I hesitated. What if he didn't join us? Luckily, Tabitha saved me. What's the matter? Scared of heights? What? No, of course not, Ben stammered. I just think, great! I wasn't about to lose this opportunity. Give me a leg up, would ya? Once we'd been hoisted up, I pushed my hand through the broken pane, unlatching the door from the inside. Shall we? You seem to be feeling a lot happier about this, Tabitha noted. I held my breath. Surely that idiot wasn't catching on to. I'm glad this is working, she beamed at me. Ah, of course not. Even Ben, less gullible and much less reckless, seemed distracted by his love of abandoned building and industrial architecture. How did you find this place? Jack did. Apparently his grandpa owned it in the 80s. After that, it had been the property of a cat food place. They only packed up last year. I wonder if the machine still works. We were nearly at the railing, nearly at the exact spot where Jack had been a year Tuesday. Tabitha was leaning over now. It would only take a small push to hope the motion sensors were still on. I glanced at the spot for a moment. No light. Damn it. But there was a control box just to story up. It seemed, ac it seemed easy to access if I barged past Tabitha, pretending not to notice until she screamed. Tabitha! I'm fine, she called back, but I think my foot is stuck in the thingy. I can't move. I turned to Ben. Reckon if we got to the manual controls, we could loosen the grip on it. He looks unconvinced. I'll stay here. Try to pull her up. It astounds me how quickly some people lose all sense of survival in a dangerous situation. OK, I'll see what I can do. I managed to wriggle the door free and sat at the booth, staring at all the buttons. Hurry, Ben screamed. It's complicated. I don't know what anything does. I found an off switch, finally, and flipped it. Machinery word to life, quote croaking from under use, but nonetheless happy to be awake again. Tabitha squealed, frantically wrenching her leg. Come on, you have to help! For all his credit, Ben was so fucking stupid. I finally saw the button labelled Mincer. The whir wasn't loud enough to drown out their hysterical screams as the sword clawed their way up at Tabitha's legs and torso. Tabitha! Ben's face was splattered in her blood as she gripped his arms. Paralyzed, he fell in headfirst shortly after. Chunks of skin, ragged clothes, and the occasional two flew out the machine, swallowing up the two people I'd been closest to since I was 12. Their bodies, reduced to mush, shot through tubes, getting filtered, steamed, and pressed, and ground. Finally, they were reduced to seven unlabeled, rusty cans overflowing with a lumpy paste. Dinner is served, I told the inanimate remains, shutting down the machines. I didn't want to eat Jack either. But the doors were locked and there was no sign of anyone coming and I was just so hungry. I thought I was going to starve. It took a few bites to get used to it, but eventually I was chugging down entire cans of flesh, hungry for more. I can't remember what I told the authorities, but the cat food company recalled 50,000 cans the next day and eventually went out of business, having developed something of an infamy. This time, there was so much more to eat that I considered taking some back to the road. But honestly, it was so tender, tangier than anything I'd ever had, and something just compelled me to eat. I was found earlier this morning, bloated and asleep, still spilling from my mouth, empty tins rolling around me. They arrested me. Maybe I'll be put on death row. But honestly, it was worth it. That was the best last meal ever. Thanks very much, Flint, I think. Gross. Um, yeah. I like the mystery and how it sort of got increasingly sinister as we went on. Brilliant. 
Um, and now on to our final student reader, Riley. Hi, I'm Riley Morris, and this is my short story, Cycle. The dishes aren't done. The dishes aren't done, and you've been home for not five minutes. You'd managed to dodge any overtime work so you could come home when you were supposed to, and the dishes aren't done. The plates gleam white, offensively so where they're neatly stacked like the paperwork you'd hunched yourself over the entire day so you could come back home now instead of later. You sigh, letting your briefcase fall to the side of the couch and shrugging off your suit jacket before you start looking for them. You keep your shoes on. You like the heavy sound they make as you walk. The hunt finishes before it's really begun, the bathroom door holding firm when you try to open it. Honey, I need the toilet. You don't, but you might later, and when that happens you won't have the time to have this conversation, so you'll have it now. When all you get in response is silence, you have to calm your tightening grip on the handle. You can break the lock with brute strength if you really need to, but you're tired. Tired and fed up, and taking it out on the door, standing there cold and emotionless as it is, will do nothing but bring about a repairman and his cost. You picture that, some hourly paid schmuck in overalls, Sue moving out where the latch would have gouged out a piece of the door frame. It'd be right next to the kitchen, a perfect view of the sink where your honey should be doing the dishes by then, and there's no way he wouldn't try to start a conversation. Not with your honey right there, and good, and... And the handle squeaks where you're gripping it, the lock crying out. They must hear it too, because there's a small muffled cry. The noise cuts off quickly, unlike the lock, which continues to strain. It's an annoying sound, like a baby refusing to shut up. You'd refuse babies, just like you'd refuse locks of anything other than the bathroom door. It'd been for gar guests, but your honey uses it too. Maybe you can get rid of this lock too, if you tell them bringing back friends is simply too much hassle. I've been working all day, you say, and you're really going to make me wait to go to the toilet. You've released the door handle now, but a squeak comes anyway. This one is far more fulfilling even when it's not by your own hand. There's shuffling inside and then the handle twists slowly but surely. You twist it the rest of the way, already having waited enough. When you open the door, they're there, head bowed like a dog who knows they've done wrong. And aren't you supposed to rub that dog's face into the carpet they've pissed on? You grab your honey's wrist because if you're lenient, if you don't show them what they've done wrong, they might one day bite back. Tough love is what it's called. They stumble along no louder than the creak of their bones under your grip, and definitely no words about how you said you needed the toilet, so you know you're doing it right. You set them in front of the sink, and they stare at the plates stacked up to dry, then at you, then back at the plates like they don't understand. They stare instead of ask, like some confused animal that doesn't have the advantage of words. So you say, you missed a spot. Their nod is slow, so slow it's almost difficult to take it for a nod. You place a hand on the, na the nape of their neck, a sturdy guiding one, because you can't have that. If they take as long with the dishes, you two will be here all night. You stay like that, standing over them as they clean the dishes again, and you tell them you let them know when they're lagging. A small squeeze of your grip, and they jerk back to work just like they should. When it's done and they're putting the plates back to dry, the skin of their neck is indented from your hand. You lean over, both to see the beginning marks of blue and black forming like a collar, and to press a delicate kiss there you're not sure they can even feel. They let out a shuddering breath and you don't care if it's from the kiss or something else. Am I doing it right? They ask, and you hum because yes, yes they're doing it right and they're doing it so well. You leave them to it, the plates gleaming behind you just as they did before. The laundry isn't folded. Thanks very much, Riley. Yeah, such a physical textured piece. Really interesting work. And thank you very, very much to all of our student readers. Um, if you would like to read more um, flash fiction pieces, then this is available as an anthology. I think the link's just been popped into the chat 
for you there. So if you do want to get hold of a copy, um, follow the link. Um, but now on to Fraser, who is going to begin by giving us a reading from Greyfriars Reformatory in the flesh here. Greetings, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Hope you're getting in the uh, Samhain spirit, getting ready for Halloween. Um, Robots, Rogues and Revenants, the link is there and fantastic stories from our students this year. Um, and all proceeds, of course, go to NHS combined charities. So any profits from either the ebook or the paperback or by both, um, they make excellent Halloween and Christmas gifts. Um, all proceeds go to the NHS combined charities. Um, and Greyfriars Reformatory is out in hardback, paperback, and ebook right now. Um, and it tells the story of Emily Drake, who um, is institutionalized at Greyfriars Reformatory. She's been there before, but she's a bit of an unreliable narrator. So she can't quite remember what's transpired at the reformatory before and things are coming back to haunt her. Now, as we're all kind of stuck indoors quite a lot with this lockdown scenario, this global plague, um, I thought that it'd be fun to kick off with a section from the book, one of the very few sections of the book where somebody goes outside for a bit into nature. So this is from chapter six, which uh, the, the chapter subheading is The Path to True Rehabilitation. Um, this sees young Emily Drake, 19 years old, incarcerated at this experimental facility, attempting to escape into the wilderness. I tell myself that it's just the wind making me feel cold. And so I hurry on, eager to be away from the dead hair. High above me, the sky boils with thunderclouds. I can almost feel the pressure of a gathering storm crushing down on me. Instinctively, I fold my arms around my body and, my head tucked down against the elements, I push along the path. A few moments later, and to my utter relief, the path leads me under tree cover. With the canopy of trees above me, I feel hidden from the world. The trees are densely packed together, growing wild from wherever they've taken root. All the scents of the forest are alive in my nostrils, and I breathe them in eagerly. Fresh pine blends with damp earth and the freshness of the wind, which becomes a gentle breeze the farther I walk into the forest. Twigs snap beneath my feet, and leaf litter rustles. Pretty soon, I'm walking on a soft, springy carpet of pine needles, and I realise that the path has disappeared completely. I'm lost in this forest, strolling all alone. Stark nature is around me. It's actually really glorious. Then I hear the pitter-patter of a few raindrops as they begin to fall on the leaves. Oh crap, nature might be glorious, but it's also unpredictable and unforgiving. The sound of the rainfall builds as the heavens open. I dive for cover under the largest nearby tree I can find. For a little while, I just sit there, arms around my knees, listening to the rain. There is a loud splosh as a particularly large raindrop penetrates my shelter and lands on a leaf beside me. The leaf bounces up as the raindrop falls to earth, and I notice something clinging to its underside. I pull the leaf gently toward me so I can take a better look and see that the object is a chrysalis. Its light brown fabric makes the little cylinder look rather like a cigar. I stroke the surface of the chrysalis. It's incredibly fragile, and yet it looks so strong as though it could survive anything nature can throw at it. Thunder rumbles and I swear I can feel it vibrate the earth beneath me. The wind picks up and there's a sharp scent of electricity in the air. A flash goes off with all the intensity of a light bulb and momentarily the chrysalis looks as though it's glowing orange with a spark of life burning from deep inside of it. There's a thunderclap, incredibly loud and much too close for comfort this time. 
the wind blows more ferociously, bringing horizontal rain with it. My already quite wet clothes begin to stick to my arms and legs. I take the chrysalis in my hand and then pull the leaf away from its branch. Holding the chrysalis up inside the leaf, I tuck the little bundle inside my clothing next to my breast. The rain is blowing in all directions now, so I walk away from the tree, intent on outrunning the thunder and the lightning. No such luck. With some effort, I make it to the tree line, but the storm continues gathering in strength all around me. As I pass through the trees, the land drops away into a steep and muddy slope. I slip and slide in the stuff as my feet try to gain purchase on the sodden terrain. I decide to try to circle the perimeter of trees to see if the ground levels out further along. The howling wind and rain lash unforgivingly at my limbs as I try my utmost to push onward. My face stings from the icy rain and my clothes are plastered to my legs. I swear I could just lean forward and find myself supported by the wind. It's that strong. I'm being battered by the elements. Maybe leaving the dubious shelter of the tree was a mistake after all. And then, as if to prove my thesis, a gust of wind knocks me off balance. My feet slip from under me in the wet mud and I take a tumble down the slope. At the bottom, I fall headlong into a cold, muddy puddle of rainwater. Kneeling on all fours with the murky water directly below me, I see my reflection, dark and indistinct. The wind moves the surface of the puddle's dark mirror, distorting my facial features. Ripples form with each raindrop, furthering the effect. I dislike the way my strands of hair take on the aspect of water weeds. I can't see who I am anymore. The lashing rain beats against my back, willing me to just give up the ghost and fall headfirst into the water. I look up and see an impassable quagmire stretching out before me. Placing a hand on my breast, I feel the little chrysalis there still swaddled in its leaf. My skin is so numb from the pummeling rain that I can't tell if I should feel cold or not. I smash the water with my right hand, shattering my muddied reflection. A ringing in my ears begins. It starts to drown out even the sound of the rain. I glance over my shoulder, back the way I came. Night is falling by the time I get back to Greyfriars Reformatory. And thanks to Pippin the cat there for joining me for the reading. He often sits down on my lap for a story. Yeah, the tail sort of flicking across the screen was, was yeah, a nice touch. <laughs> Thank you very, very much for that, Fraser. Um, really, really nice sort of section to read. Like I say, it gets us outdoors. Um, I guess that kind of one of my questions for you that fits quite nicely for I kind of was going to ask a couple just to get us going and give our audience time to have a think about what they might like to ask you. Um, I taught a workshop last week on eco fiction um, and was quite interested in this relationship between sort of writing about the environment and writing genre. Would you say a little bit about sort of where you stand and how, how sort of nature writing features in your horror and how sort of that that wider relationship really because I know it's something that you you often come back to in your writing we've had trees and forests previously yeah yeah we've had some quite disgusting things with trees in particular in the jack and the green <laughs> but we won't talk about that um yeah I think I think nature and going back to something ancient is um is always a, a central sort of theme in what I write. I love the way that you know the old ways rubbing shoulders with the new ways and we try and build on top of this unstable surface of, of nature and what's gone before and we can never quite uh, tame it and, and that kind of mirrors what's often going on in the characters that there's this kind of bestial ancient something trying to break through. So 
I think when I, right from when I started writing fiction and films, there was always that kind of uneasy partnership of civilization and nature. Um, and perhaps writing folk horror without even realizing it, because there, you know, there does tend to be a summoning of sorts and some isolation going on and very urbane, civilized people going into difficult scenarios, um, whether it be, you know, the reformatory in the Greyfriars reformatory or the cottage in Halfstone Cottage or, you know, the, the kind of corporate man abroad in the Jack in the Green and a very naive kind of city girl um, trying to make her way in the world in the lamplighters, uh, going to this strange otherworldly place filled with nature and um, if you can get your characters into a position of vulnerability in that way then hopefully the readers can feel vulnerable as well as they're reading the story and the horror can happen you know nice thank you um, and second question from me um, I'm a bit obsessed with Shirley Jackson just generally um, yeah and I, I thought of her when you said at the start um, about Emily being an unreliable narrator. Um, and I sat down to read some of this um, in preparation for the session today. Um, and the narrator herself flags up the fact very early on that she is indeed unreliable. And it made me think of the likes of Haunting of Hill House. And we have always lived in the castle where we're presented with these sort of first person unreliable narrators and how that's kind of a function of sort of something that people are drawn to in horror as a way of sort of telling a story and I just kind of wanted to know about your decision to sort of work with that idea of an unreliable narrator and what that enables you to do in terms of genre. It was, in, that, that's really kind of you to uh, even mention Shirley Jackson in the same room as this book but I've read a lot of Jackson, I've, I've been reading a short story, some of which I've never read before and they're, they really are terrific. Um, I think as a writer, allowing the character to, I mean, Emily says she's, I, she says, I guess I'm, I, I guess that makes me an unreliable narrator. She can't even be relied upon to decide for sure if she is or not. Uh, in a way, it's a cheat for the writer because it allows you to be unreliable. So in horror, it's, it's especially useful because you can play you can you can play little tricks sleight of hand did did you see that did you not see it was it there or a moment later it's gone um and and of course i tried to you know when i was rewriting the draft i tried to work it in as much as possible that the, that there would be glaring inconsistencies in what she was saying so she is only 19 but then she goes on very quickly to say all my adult life you know, so there are these little discoveries to be, they're like little Easter eggs in the story. really. Um, so on the one hand, it's very freeing, but then you realise that like everything else you write, it does have a, an internal logic to it and it does have a structure. And then it becomes incredibly difficult because you want it to be consistent. And you can't, it doesn't mean that you can just get away with throwing anything into the story and you, you do have to tread quite carefully after that. Luckily, my editor, the brilliant Don Dowier, whose name means literally the Pope of Fear, um, Don Dowier found a couple of elements in the story that, that, that sort of leapt out at him as being inconsistent with what we'd been told earlier on. So I was really grateful for him uh, saving my my bacon there you know he's always a good editor will always have your back and um you get very close to your work and i got very close to emily who's who's you know 90 percent telling the story that there, there are chapters that are written third person which give us um glimpses of backstory of the other inmates at the reformatory um and allows me to kind of step out of the frame and do some other types of horror uh, I was I was uh, a bit worried that initially going in to what is my first first person novel um, to to just be doing the same scare over and over again, you know, like 
did I see it? Was it there? Oh, it's gone now. Oh, I heard something. I must be losing my mind. You know, so I, I wanted to interject with other kinds of uh, sometimes very visceral horror. Um, but always coming back to Emily and her unreliability, I was able to character map Emily across the novel in such a way that she really starts to learn the life lessons and she does start to grow as a character and step up as a final girl in a horror story, you know. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to open it up to questions from our audience now. So can I ask that if you have a question, you can either pop it into the chat um, or if you would like to unmute yourselves and speak, could I ask you to use the chat to let us know that you'd like to ask a question um, and then we can invite you to unmute yourselves and speak. OK, Max, go for it. Fraser, I'd like to ask a very uh, general question. Um, I'm always fascinated by it, where people's kind of love of, of genre comes from. Was there a moment in your childhood um, whether it was a film or a book or an incident that happened in your life that basically turned you on to horror and made you realise that this was the sort of genre that you felt the most kind of identity with and wanted to sort of, you know, consume and also, I guess, in later life, write. Thank you, Dr. Innings, for this marvellous question. Um, well, of course, the context is living in Staffordshire which is horrifying enough underneath the gray layer of smog from the brick kilns you know a day out fishing in the shivering cold by the zanussi factory next to the canal you know this is horror enough but then when i was around sort of nine or ten i would stay over at my dad's for the weekend and, and i'd have sole use of the television now of course i'm from another century entirely so we had three channels not all of them worked all, all the time and, and uh it was the it was the weekend double bill hammer horror or universal monsters so i quickly fell in love with christopher lee's dracula uh peter cushing you can see behind me there his van helsing second to none um, and also his uh, Victor Frankenstein, second to none, um, and Bela Lugosi and all of them, you know. Uh, and then I started reading horror stories. So I was reading the pan books of horror stories, some of them really quite out there. You know, one of the ones that made an impression on me as a 10 or 11 year old reading this was uh, a story about a brother and sister who take their new friend from the neighborhood into their garden shed and they basically eviscerate her body they take her eyeballs out and and it goes into really graphic gruesome district uh, description of these acts and i was hooked i was absolutely hooked i loved it um and then I was listening to Radio Luxembourg and things like that, and they'd have like armchair theatre, so they'd have ghost stories and mystery stories dramatised on the radio. Uh, I was just eating it up by that point. And then age 12, I read The Exorcist, as you do. Didn't see the film till I was 14. Completely traumatised me. Um, but I was always fascinated by how they did it. How did, how did they manage to traumatise me so much? So that's when I got into writing my own and I started writing uh, horror stories and playing role playing games and stuff when I was in my early teens. And I guess with another genre, you never need to grow up. So we're still we're still here walking our shizzle. Thank you. Any more questions for any of you, either through the chat or if you'd like to speak? Kirsty, go for it. Pretty good. Thank you. Um, my question was, um, I was just wondering how much um, plotting do you think you need or how much do you do for plotting um, horror fiction? Thanks, Kirsty, And uh, congratulations as well on your forthcoming uh, debut novel. We're all looking forward to that for sure. Um, yeah, plotting is important. Um, 
a good character that you can root for obviously is the main thing and the story must come from the character and their hang-ups and their leap of faith towards the end which is or isn't going to fail and the evil is going to come back and for another cycle or or it's going to be vanquished and everyone can walk away happy go for a picnic but uh in the in the plotting sort of side of thing i do work to quite a detailed outline um, with gray friars it was written versions of that story being written as a screenplay prior to writing the novel so i had about eight drafts of the screenplay i think very different to the book the book enabled me to do a lot of research into disassociative disorders and out-of-body experiences and things like that which is why emily is so unreliable on on one level um what i found was that um the the sort of backbone of the plot was dictated by a couple of drafts of the screenplay that kind of merged together um but i i did rewrite and a detailed outline that went several pages deep um prior to drafting the novel um sometimes you know like with jack and the green i hadn't decided on an ending i had two different endings um so i, I do have some room for experimentation sometimes but i've found that working to a more detailed outline cuts down on the amount that i will go off at a tangent with the novel um, so I started writing the novel in uh, in June uh, 2019 and completed the novel. I sent it to the editor uh, on 28th December. So it wouldn't have happened that quickly if I hadn't plotted it out in as much detail, I don't think. Um, but not everyone likes to write that way, you know. But but I do. I get I get lost in the darkness that I create if I don't have something to cling on to, and that's the structure, the backbone of the story. <laughs> Thank you. Any more questions? If there aren't any more questions, or if people are just thinking, um, mm -hmm. I've got a very short extract from later in the novel that I'd like to share. Um, so Emily, having discovered that she can't escape, uh, there's nowhere to run to, nowhere to hide in this wilderness outside the reformatory, um, she then has to become subsumed by the relentless and rather wearing uh, routine that's imposed upon the inmates by the icy Principal Quick who runs the institution. So this small section is from chapter eight, The Other Inmate. My breathing becomes ragged as I struggle to keep up the pace. Quick has had us out here for what feels like an age, running around and around the courtyard, lab rats in a maze, or rather I feel like one of those horses you see being trained in a paddock. And now I think of it, I'm pretty sure Quick would be cracking a whip if she had one to hand. My ankles ache from the continued pounding of my feet against the concrete surface of the recreation yard. The air seems to be charged with electricity, like a storm is coming. My pulse throbs in my ears so hard that I feel my eardrums might actually burst. I haven't been feeling so well since the principal put me under with her weird metronome gizmo. I can sense the onset of another out-of-body event, but instead of my ears ringing, I hear something else as I run. It sounds like a discordant nursery rhyme. On instinct, I look up and see the clock tower silhouetted against the sky. I slow down because my legs feel heavy, as though I've waded into thick mud. My hands drop to my sides and I feel something alarming. A slender little hand holds on to mine gently. It is cold. I look down at my hand. Nothing there. I slow to a strolling pace and then look up at the clock tower. There's a girl up there and she's staring right at me. The pallor of her skin has a disturbing quality. It looks totally grey 
like she's dead but alive. I wonder then if she's looking at me or behind me. I turn to look in that direction and my eyes meet Principal Quick's. Keep the pace up, Emily, the principal intones before scowling at me. I prepare to start running again, but first I feel compelled to return my gaze to the clock tower. The grey girl is gone. Thank you. Okay, so we've had another question come through from Rua, who says, I was wondering if it was difficult to bring freshness to the setting of a reformatory. If if it was, how did you tackle this? Thanks, Rua. I love that question. And I'm so glad you asked because I was asked to write a piece for the Horror Writers Association for their Halloween haunts series of blogs that they do every October. And I, I, I compartmentalised something in my mind when I was writing the reformatory, I didn't even realise um, that I was drawing on uh, a nine week shoot film shoot that I was on in the late 90s for a film called Siamese Cop that was never released. Two cops, one jacket was the tagline. And um, it was produced by David Heyman, who did the Harry Potter films, and he hadn't done those yet. Um, and I was in charge of locking up at the end of each evening, and, and we, were, we were filming at, at Free and Barnet Mental Asylum, um, where one of Alistair Crowley's wives went insane and was kept for a while, and one of the Jack the Ripper suspects was interred at, um, at Free and Barnet, uh, Kosminsky, um, the Russian suspect. Um, so without realising it, I was channeling this dreadful place, this cold and oppressive place with its peeling walls and endless corridors. In fact, uh, the corridor at Free and Barnet was the longest corridor in Europe. Um, and I was the one who had to go all the way up to the end of the corridor and turn the lights off and then just leg it through the darkness with a wonky flashlight to go and close up and padlock the thing and um, one day a few of us went into the basement to see the um, isolation wards where people were kept in uh, solitary confinement and it was dreadful down there and you could see scratch marks on the walls and stuff and they still had some of the old rusty metal beds and buckets that would use be used as latrines terrible place um, but wonderful for a horror writer because I soaked all of this atmosphere up so without even realizing it I think I got the freshness and the authenticity that I needed to breathe fetid air into those corridors of Greyfriars Reformatory by drawing on this actual life experience of having been in this place and I went back a few years later and they they were turning the Freeman Barnet Mental Asylum into um, Luxury apartments. Uh, I think some boy bands bought apartments there for millions of pounds. And I just wondered how anyone could sleep in that place. I mean, it must be haunted to death. Um, so maybe that's the sequel. Greyfriars Reformatory, the luxury apartments. <laughs> yeah, some real world research to draw upon. So a question three from Harry. Um, as a newbie reader of horror and an excessive scaredy cat, do you have any tips on how to read horror without becoming completely paralyzed with fear? I'd like to be able to turn my lights off at night. Okay, Harry, well, you're my kind of audience. Because if you're easily scared, I, I'd love hundreds of people like you, if not thousands or millions to read my work and, and and then go on Goodreads the next day and say, it was absolutely petrifying. Um, I mean, I did have a, re a review of the last book, Halfstone Cottage, one reviewer on the blog tour couldn't finish, <laughs> which I took as a badge of honor. But for you, my friend, I think the best thing you can do is text to speech and, uh, you know, have, have a kind of uh, cartoon character, pipsqueak kind of voice reading the horror to you. 
rather than reading it alone at night. So if you're listening to the horror and it's in a very cute voice, it might um, not give you nightmares. Then again, it might make it worse. Uh, if it's a little squeaky voice telling you there's a clown under the bed. So all I can really say is good luck and happy Halloween. It also, again, makes me think of, you know, we mentioned Shirley Jackson and the idea perhaps of weird fiction. So rather than going sort of all out horror, just sort of those, those stories that sort of unsettle, but we can't quite put our fingers on why, um, might be a good sort of way in sort of sideways to the genre, I think, for those perhaps... That don't that, like sort of jump scare or, or gore that we get with perhaps some of the horror. Yeah, I think I, th I think that's the way to go. More weird fiction, bizarro fiction, um, or Doctor Who. You know, because because with Doctor Who, you know that the the monster has a backstory, and they're often quite sympathetic, and they they didn't mean to blow up the planet. Uh, they're just a bit dysfunctional, and the Doctor will always win the day. So you have that structure in place that reassurance that even if there are weeping angels blah 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 uh, the doctor's going to win through in the end um, some collateral damage but your nerves should be intact and could i ask one final question before we wrap up and that is so grey fires at its heart is a ghost story it's a haunting um, could you maybe recommend to us for the season some some of those stories that perhaps have inspired you or informed you or that you've just sort of enjoyed returning to over the years? Oh yes. Um, so recent a recent discovery is uh, ah, there are so many, but the, the yeah the Shirley Jackson the lottery collection. Um, if if you don't own that, you've you've just Got, got to get it. And then another recent discovery was Edith Nesbitt, mm. who wrote brilliant children's fiction, um, has written some amazing ghost and bizarre stories. Um, the Sick Drug is, I think it's called The Sick Drug, is, is uh, an amazing science fiction horror mystery hybrid, decades ahead of its time. She wrote a really scary story about a, a statue that comes to life so she preempted the weeping angels there um, and I've recently been turned on to a writer um, African-American writer D.S. Fox who wrote a short story called Dreads which is now a mainstay because it's kind of it's got this real kind of magic that this voodoo magic that beautifully rendered um, and um, you can also find a collection uh, called Sycorax's Daughters, which is entirely written by black female writers and they're the new voices in the field that we should all be paying attention to. Um, but dialing it back, I mean, I can never escape uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, which is still my favorite novel of all time because it has everything. It has reanimated cadavers, it has a doomed love story, it has everything. Um, and of course, you've mentioned Shirley Jackson many times in this session. Her ghost draws near. Um, the, the, the Haunting of Hill House is, is an unmitigated classic. And also Susan Hill's Woman in Black. Um, you can't go wrong with that. And um, and one final one, all, I think all of those, all of that kind of influenced this book because it, it's really an exercise in atmospheric writing as much as it is about jolting. The, you know, you can't really do jump scares in horror novels unless you put caps lock on, you know, and you turn the page, you, go, you know, or you have a pop-up page. So it's all about atmospheric writing and trying to get people in, in, into the zone with you. And... Um, I think all of those influenced it, but also um, Patrick McGrath's novel Asylum as well is a real kind of how-to essay in terms of a character's psychological breakdown and how it maps onto the atmosphere of the building that they're in, and that's very that kind of uh, 
symbiotic relationship between place and person that you get in a novel like that. Fantastic. Oh. And if you want any other suggestions, please, and you're studying at Brunel and you're about to do your second year, please sign up for the horror sci-fi fantasy module where we'll talk about this stuff every week and call it research. Nice, thank you very much. So yeah, lo lots of reading recommendations there as well as opportunities to return to old favourites. Um, so we're going to wrap up now. Um, so thank you again everyone for joining us um, and for your questions. Thank you very much Fraser and thank you to our student readers for sharing your stories with us today. Um, just a quick note to say, I hope you all can join us next week um, on the 3rd of November. We'll have um, novelist and Brunel alumni Helen Cullen here to talk about her most recent novel. So again, be great to ha have you there. Um, but otherwise, yeah, we'll, we'll say adios and happy goth Christmas, aka Halloween. Um, and yeah, see you all soon. Thank you, everyone. Happy Halloween. Happy Samhain and cheers to our brilliant student readers.